Apple's new M1 computers have been praised to the moon and back by well, pretty much everyone. And look, I don't want to diminish what everyone said. They really are great. But are they, are they that great? This little PC is just a little bit bigger than an M1 Mac Mini, but it's fully upgradable and packs a major punch with an AMD Renoir APU. Uh, APU? What's that? Well, that's what AMD calls their CPUs with integrated graphics for laptops. The 4750G is a laptop chip, but housed inside a more traditional CPU package, and it's no slouch. It's an 8-core, 3.6 gigahertz Ryzen 4000 chip with an 8-core Vega GPU on board. And that's not the only trick that this little black box packs. Take a look at its left side and you'll see a fairly sizable heatsink? <laughs> what? Yeah, you guessed right. This computer is cooled passively in its entirety without a fan in sight. Not even the M1 Mac Mini can claim that. And now it's time to put both through their paces and see if Apple Silicon is really all it's cracked up to be. Uh, speaking of crack, I couldn't afford it without today's sponsor, Raf Power. That's a joke, kids. I don't do drugs and neither should you. Sobriety is sexy. Where was I? Um, oh, sexy, just like our sponsor, Raf Power, and their new MagSafe iPhone charger. It's cheap, it comes with a power supply, and it's black. Get yours today with the link below. In your typical PC versus Mac comparison video, the ones you'd find on YouTube, of which there are many, benchmarks are usually reserved for later in the video, but I'm actually going to be mentioning them first because frankly, it's a bloodbath. Cinebench, surprisingly, gives us the closest results with the M1 barely edging out the PC in single core performance and getting, well, manhandled in multi-core performance. And the story continues throughout, wait a minute. No, that can't be right. No, these notes, they don't make any sense. That story doesn't add up. But wait, it does. And yeah, it is. The M1 gives the PC a beatdown in almost every other synthetic benchmark, like Geekbench and Novabench. And in the real world, things don't look any better for our poor PC. In the Blender BMW test, the M1 actually scores disappointingly close to the Ryzen APU until you realize, wait a minute, the M1 isn't even running this natively. It is translating the x86 Intel binary to ARM. And in a real world Premiere Pro 4K video export, the victory laps do not stop. The Ryzen chip's OpenGL support is just no match for the M1 equipped with the Metal Graphics API. One of the pitches for the Ryzen 4000 APUs was that their internal graphics performance would match or exceed Intel's iGPUs in similar SKUs, and they largely do. But Apple has just really done an excellent job with the M1's graphics processor, taking much of what they learned from the iPad. And in Unigen Heaven, the graphics benchmark, the M1 scores more than double that of the Ryzen 4750G. Now I'm no dummy, I've been around the block and I know that there are some of you furiously typing on your keyboards one of several responses and hold on, I'll address them because you're right about being wrong. Many of you may be quick to point out that hold up, this isn't fair. The Mac mini has active cooling and that poor Ryzen chip, well, it does not. Surely if there was a bigger case with proper fans, that chip would perform better. <laughs> okay, fine, you, you got me. This Recom DB1 PC case is awesome with superb build quality, easy installation, and completely silent operation. I should disclose that Streetcom did send it over for this video, but I'm not sponsored by them and I'm, I'm sending it back. I just genuinely think it's just about the perfect case for a low TDP Ryzen chip like this. The ultimate HTPC build. But I, I can't lie, I did cripple the 4750G a little bit. You see, it's a 65 watt TDP chip and the DB1 case, well, it has a maximum thermal design power rating of 45 watts. Remember, TDP is not a measure of power consumption, but the amount of heat produced. We're over budget, this chip is too hot. And so I had to go into the BIOS on the motherboard and select a low power profile because without it, the machine was hitting its T-junction temperature and crashing. For the pedantic few of you rushing to hit the thumbs down button on this video, wait, I would like to placate you because I did put it in a bigger case with a massive CPU cooler and the chip did improve. 
by a margin of about 5 to 15 percent. But it's still lost to the M1. By a lot. And that's not the point anyways. The Mac Mini is frankly much bigger than it needs to be. And I'm assuming that Apple retained the same form factor because the Mac Mini doesn't sell in huge volumes. And those that do buy it are organizations like schools and companies like Mac Stadium that have racks built out for that now 10-year-old form factor. Oh, check that video out, by the way, if you haven't seen it. But that makes the chassis inside largely empty, and only a small cooling assembly fits atop the M1 chip itself. That fan and heatsink, the same one found on the previous 2018 Intel Mac Mini, is capable of cooling a 65 watt TDP chip. The M1 is estimated to have a near 18 watt TDP, which means that the fan almost never spins, and when it does, it's just at a few hundred RPM and thus completely inaudible, even under load in a quiet room. By volume, the power supply is by far the largest and heaviest component in the Mac Mini. It's the same 150 watt power supply that Apple was using in the previous Mac Mini, and it is needlessly overpowered to the point of hilarity, and I presume that Apple is only using it due to economies of scale. It's cheaper to keep making the same one, even if it's a little more expensive, than it would be to redesign and handle logistics and inventory for a new part SKU on a computer that really doesn't sell that well. And so this is where the already impressive M1 gets mind-blowing, and where people just don't get it. The PC, which is using a repackaged laptop chip, in essence, just like the M1, is by every measure in the x86 world an outstandingly efficient chip. In our test, it pulls just over 80 watts from the wall under load when running a Prime 95 stress test. The performance per watt is near class leading. It is really impressive. Well, at least until you look at the M1. The Mac Mini pulls just 30 watts from the wall under maximum load. It isn't just achieving double the performance of its closest x86 competitor, but it's doing so with 60% less power draw. That is absolutely incredible. Crazier yet, these Macs are actually, and I can't believe I'm saying this because we're talking about Apple products here, they're actually a rather excellent deal. <laughs> to build this PC as close to spec as you can, you need to get within a lunch or two of the Mac Mini's price. They're almost the same. And that's assuming that you can get the Ryzen 4750G CPU for its trade price, which you can't because it's not available to consumers. And so you're not buying in bulk, you're not HP, you have to go to eBay and they cost more there. So practically building this system today really costs you just shy of $1,000. Now, keyboard warriors, I know where you're going with this. You can build a better PC than that with a thousand dollars? Yes, you can. That's true. But not in the same footprint and not with the same power envelope. You cannot compare a Toyota Tundra and a Toyota Camry even though they're both Toyotas. They have massively different use cases and strengths. In the laptop market, Apple is going to appear untouchable for a while. Now, the performance they're getting out of the M1 isn't the best of any laptop available, but it's not as far off as you'd think, and its total power draw is even less than some of the weakest low-power chips out there. To put things into perspective, the beefiest laptop chip on the market at the moment right now is the new Ryzen 5900HX, with a massive TDP of 45 to 60 watts adjustable. If we take the fanless MacBook Air the Ultrabook, with its slightly thermally limited 10 watt TDP CPU, and run the same 10 minute Cinebench R23 benchmark, the M1 gets crushed with just over half the multi-core score. However, the 5900X, according to a notebook check article, draws up to 128 watts of power under load. The M1 MacBook Air? 22. <laughs> no, not 122. 22. In terms of performance per watt, the MacBook Air is 328% more efficient than the 5900X. But wait, that, that's the most powerful laptop chip on the market, so of course it's going to be less efficient. We should really compare it to, again, our 4750G. And if we do, the M1 is still 60% more efficient while achieving nearly double the performance numbers in multiple real-world scenarios. This is impressive, sure, but some people, well, they don't want a Camry, they want a Ferrari. 
performance above all else. Because Apple's M1 is so efficient, they can theoretically scale up the size of the die, the literal size of the chip, and thus the performance, relatively easily, in theory. A report from Bloomberg late last year tackled a leak about the next big Apple Silicon Pro chip that's basically well, it's just a juiced up M1 with 16 large CPU cores and 32 integrated GPU cores, increasing the physical size of the chip, the size of the die, by 400%. At a five nanometer density, this new chip, as compared to the M1, would be insanely huge. But compared to other dies on the market, it's really not. NVIDIA is pushing beyond 600 millimeters squared in their desktop GPUs. And even on their mobile 2080 chip, they're at 500 millimeters squared. Apple's proposed next gen chip, if this is real, would be half that at around 300 millimeters squared. So a big chip? Yeah. A hot chip? Likely. Uh, too hot for a fanless laptop? Absolutely but probably not for a performance-focused laptop and certainly not for a desktop. And a chip like that, well, it could take the performance we have in the M1 and multiply it by a factor of two and a half to three times, which would put it in the performance of AMD's best Threadripper chips while still consuming less energy than an average performance consumer desktop chip. <sighs> Of course, none of that has happened yet, and this is all pure conjecture, but this much is true. The M1, it's not overrated. Now, it might not be the chip for you, it might not be the truck you need, but I'd argue that it's the chip for many, maybe even most, even for me. And it, along with its yet announced successors, will continue to demonstrate that the efficiency of building something in-house with the instruction mix, buses, cache locations and quantities, coprocessors and additional additives allow for optimization and vertical integration that a one size all chip, well, it just can't accomplish. And now to my supple sponsor voice. Rav Power is not new around here, but they make crazy great stuff all the time, so I've never had to repeat an ad. Their latest is this awesome MagSafe charger for iPhone. It's just like Apple's MagSafe, except way less money, especially with my discount code. And it comes with the necessary 20 watt charger that's absolutely tiny, much smaller than Apple's and included, not $20 extra. So yeah, less than half of what Apple charges and you get the same thing. It's great and you should check it out. The link and coupon code is below. Apple is not going to look back. The question is whether or not slowpokes like Intel are quick enough to move forward before other companies like Microsoft begin to follow in Apple's footsteps. One thing is certain though, the next several years are going to be very exciting. Let me know what you think about this video by giving it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And if you hated it, well, send it to your friend. <laughs> They're gonna despise it. Wouldn't that be hilarious? Thank you so much for watching. Comment down below. Have you had experience with an M1 Mac? What are your thoughts? What do you envision the future of the computing world to be? And who are going to be the major players? Thank you so much for watching. And as always, stay snazzy.